This is Banjo, and today I'm going over the RAM start procedure for the F-16 and Falcon BMS, currently version 4.33. The first two points of interest I'd like to point out as we look around in the cockpit are the yellow spider claw handle, which functions as the canopy release, whereas I hover the mouse cursor over this portion of the cockpit, we can see the button used for closing the canopy, and if I select it again, we can open the canopy. The final point I'll cover before getting started is the idle cutoff, which we can see as the selectable portion just in front of the throttle. As I crank the throttle out of its idle position and select the idle cutoff and bring the throttle back to idle, this will allow the engines to finish spooling up past 20% RPM. The first step to start up is to enable main power on the selector just behind the throttle. In the battery position, we can use this position to enable a series of flight tests if we desire. For example, we test the flight control system, or test our caution advisory lights, oxygen, pitot heat, or a series of other tests. I will not be covering this today, or the emergency panel directly beside it, as so I will cover these at a later date. Next, we'll move the selector back into main power. At this point, just back a bit, and beside the cockpit wall, we can see the selector for the fuel pumps. The engines will start in the off position, although they will not feed during zero or negative G maneuvers, so we will move this into the normal operation position. At this point, we can enable the jet fuel start by right-clicking on the starter just in front of the throttle. With this, the engine startup is underway, and we're able to see that by verifying that the RPM is indeed increasing on the RPM indicator to the right of the right MFCD. Once the RPM reaches 20%, crack the throttle out of idle, hit the idle cutoff, and bring the throttle back down to idle position. As I move the view forward, we can see the air source knob. In the off position, the engine bleed air valves are closed, so we'll move this to the normal position, which will allow the air conditioning system to cool the avionics and pressurize the cabin. So at this point, we can notice that the engine has reached 20% RPM, so we'll crack the throttle out of its idle position, hit the idle detent, and bring the throttle back down to the idle position allowing the engine to finish spooling up. As the engine spools up, oil pressure will return to nominal levels, and hydraulic pressure to hydraulic systems A and B will also return to nominal levels at about the 12 o'clock position. Several avionics and indicators will be powered once the engine spools up as well, and the generators supply electricity to the aircraft. An example of this would be the gear lights indicator. One final step through the startup itself that I'll do is enable the parking brake which has two positions in BMS being off and parking brake. With the engines running and the generators supplying power to the rest of the aircraft systems, on the right console of the avionics panel will enable the power to the avionics, GPS being necessary for INS alignment, data link for sharing data link information, UFC for working the upfront console, MFD for working the MFDs, ST for store stations, and MMC for the modular mission computer. Set the INS alignment into normal alignment for a ground alignment. We could also use in-flight align to align in the air if we needed. The top row switches on the right console, the two left being the intake hard points for lantern or TGP pods. I'm not carrying any, so I'll leave these down. Enable the FCR switch. This will enable your fire control radar. And if you desire to use the radar altimeter, set it to standby and enable it once you're airborne. With power enabled, the FCR will enter a bit test for several minutes, and on the DED, we can see the status of the INS alignment. The first set of numbers is the time, with the second set being an error multiplier. So we're looking for 4.0, for a successful alignment. The letters ready will also be flashing in the lower left corner of the HUD. While waiting on alignment, we'll take a look at the right console again, just behind the sensors panel. The eight switches below the sensors panel relate to extra functions on the HUD, which are very much personal preference. The knobs below, with only two being functional, will control the internal floodlighting and instrument backlighting. The functions on the HUD panel can be covered in page 56 alone of the manual BMS F16CM1.pdf in the docs folder, so I will not really cover them today. Though, good examples of this are the barometric and radio altimeter setting, uh, depressible reticle setting, DED data setting, which we seen a moment ago with the INS information displayed in the lower section of the HUD. Next, we'll move back over to the left console and enable the exterior lighting, starting with the anti-collision, then I'll set it into flash, enable the wing and tail lights, and hit the master switch to enable the lighting. Next, on the auxiliary comms panel, we'll move the CNI knob into the UFC position, 
as the backup position is only used in the event the generators are not functioning. Next I'll switch the ECM toggle switch to the right of the throttle and enable power to the radar warning receiver to the right of the canopy spider claw handle. At this point I can switch on all of the toggle switches on the CMS panel, excluding the jettison toggle switch. Set the selector into the mode I desire, in this case semi, and select the program I desire. I'll also enable the helmet mounted queuing system by rotating the HMCS to on. At this point to set up the UHF radio, we'll move the selector into the both position to monitor the chosen frequency as well as the guard frequency, which is 243.0 and we'll enable all of the volume banks, including intercom, missile, IFF, TACAN, COM1, COM2, etc. The preset selector, if in manual, enter the frequency manually, or if in preset, set the chosen preset on the upper preset selector rotary knob, which in this case I'm using preset 15. This point, as we see on the left MFD, the bit test for the FCR is just about to finish, at which point it will go into standby operation. On the radar warning receiver panel, if you select the search button, this will show any search radars on the radar warning receiver, giving you a little heads up as to any SAM sites you're heading into. It will also display up to 16 contacts on the receiver. Over on the caution and advisories panel, we're able to see that we have an IFF and avionics fault. We can either acknowledge this or clear the fault. To clear the fault, we'll go into test and hit clear, which will clear the fault off of the advisories panel. On the advisory panel, we could also see ejection seat is still illuminated. We can clear this by enabling the ejection seat with the yellow handle on the left hand portion of the seat. Although, due to being able to accidentally pull the lever, we will leave this until we're ready to take off. To the right of the HSI, we have the fuel indicator selector. Currently on normal, we can move this into the exterior center line or exterior wing tanks to display any fuel in the exterior drop tanks we're carrying, allowing us to know when to jettison them when they're empty, which point we'd switch back into normal. At this point, as we look up, we'd see on the DED and in the lower left corner of the HUD that the INS alignment has finished. So it's at this point we can now move the INS knob into the nav position by left clicking on it or rotating in the upwards position. Next, to set the FCR into air to air operation, We'll select standby and then CRM. At this point, I will select assign until it says continuous. Hold the comm switch left for a moment before releasing, and this will host the data link, allowing me to see any of my wingmen on the HSD. If I select list and hit enter, I can enter the data link setting, at which point I could use the data command switch to move to the next page. Scroll down to enter any extra wingmen into my flight or I could keep scrolling down to enter any extra flights to the data link. In this case, I'll enter flights 2, 3, 4, and 5, for example. So if any other flights in the package were there, I'd see them as well. Once I'm finished setting up the data link, I can exit the data link settings by using the return function of the data command switch. Finally, I'll load the data cartridge. First, I'll select the DTE page on the right MFD. Select the load function on the top center. OSB. This will load all the banks of the data cartridge. It's at this point that I can enable power to the ejection seat to clear up the caution advisory panel, at which point I could press the nose wheel steering missile step key to enable nose wheel steering, which is the shift slash key by default, and I could call the tower by pressing T for tower and selecting 8 to remove the wheel chocks which point I could taxi over to the runway and take off. You can release the parking brake manually by placing it back into the off position, or in the real F-16 by moving the throttle an inch you would release the parking brake automatically, but in BMS throttling up to 80% will release it as well.